sort of the out-of-the-box functionality if you wanted to do an insert um, using a details view. All right. We, we did a little bit of customizing it to do a little bit of air trapping. But for the most part, we, we got um, out-of-the-box behavior. Uh, what I mean by that is um, we took the defaults, we took the way that the details view does inserts, and we pretty much used it as is. All right? And the nice thing is, well, it's one of them good news, bad news scenarios. The nice thing is that, um, well, let's do the bad first. We'll get that out of the way. Yes. And then we'll talk about the good part of it. The bad news is, is it's going to be very rare that you can use out-of-the-box functionality as it is. All right? Because there's simply too many holes in it. I mean, one of the things we noticed right off the bat is there was no validation at all. And, the, and if we didn't put some code in, it would blow up and throw an error and give an ugly error message uh, until we went in and put our own form of exception tra uh, trapping in. And also, it, it keeps you on the same page. It doesn't redirect you anywhere and so on. So sort of the default behavior definitely is ugly, all right? It, 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 it falls short a bunch of different ways. And therefore, it's not likely that you'll ever use the default out-of-the-box behavior exactly how it is, all right? Boy, that's dismal, right? Um, what's the good news? You get to use your creative abilities uh, okay. to make that happen. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, and, and along with that is that you do have the ability to customize it to make it do what, what it ought to do, all right? It might not do exactly what you want it to do initially, but you are able to creatively figure out what it should do, and you're not limited to the out-of-the-box behavior. All right, so yeah, that's part of the good news. What's the rest of the good news? The rest of the good news is it does give you a start. It gives you a head start. You don't have to code everything from scratch. So, you know, pick a job. You know, pick a non-programming job. A job around the house, washing dishes, all right, vacuuming, washing your car, running errands, whatever. If you found a tool that did half of that stuff for you, all right, you're not going to complain about having to do the other half because it's better than doing 100% of the work, all right? So we want to approach it from that perspective that the framework is not a comprehensive answer. It will almost never be a comprehensive answer. In other words, very rarely would you be able to take the code that is built into the framework and use it exactly as it is without customizing it. Uh, on our first day, we found a couple of instances where we needed to customize it, right? We found the example where um, we wanted to redirect it to another page after the insert. We found uh, where we wanted to trap for errors. All right, so, and we made those adjustments. All right, but the good news is the rest of it, it did for us. What we're going to do today is we're going to explore more of what we can do to customize um, the, the sort of out-of-the-box uh, solution. And we're going to start out very briefly by downloading what we had last time. and taking a look at it. Yeah, it would be. Does, do you want to get the door? And the lights, you might as well. I thought the fall was supposed to be the time change where you felt more alert. Right? Because you, you skip an hour back, you get an hour more sleep. That's right. I realized that Sunday was daylight savings time. That's right. Why is that not the case? Why am I more tired this week than I was last week? Dark and cold. 
Yeah, I think that might have something to do with it. It's dark and cold. All right, so I'm going to open up where we left off last time, and I will pull down the screen in a second. I saw somewhere there's a thing where they like, there's a whiteboard that you like stand on the other side of and you write and it's flipped backwards or something really weird like that. It's like, wow, that's crazy. Someone's telling me about that, that they have a couple of these on campus. All right, I'm going to set the log on to be my start page. All right. And I'm going to look at, we're going to look at, let's see the name of the page that we're going to look at, add peeps, uh, add toppings. Because if you notice, this one we're using the objects in the framework, we put them on the, the page just like we did before, and there's really almost no code here in the code behind because the objects in the framework take care of it. We automatically go into insert mode. If you remember, that was one of the things that we customized a little bit uh, by changing the default mode. So that default mode says what mode we're going to be in when we enter the screen. The default for the default mode is read only, all right, where it uh, will bring up a row and you can click new, edit, or whatever. But we set it to insert. All right. Remember to make this capable of inserting, we have to do two things, right? Because with all these database things, there's two things going on. There is the GUI, and there are the objects that handle the database interactivity. So the database one is the SQL data source. And if we look at it, not only do I have a select statement, I also have an insert statement. Insert in the toppings, followed by the names of the columns, followed by three question marks for the parameters. And then I have bound to this the details view, which has a text box for those things. All right. So. The one bit of code I added was here. Well, two bits of code. The first thing I did is I checked to see if the person is logged on. Because if they're not logged on, then they, they can't access this page. So right in the page load, I checked to see if the session first name is equal to null. Um, I could just as well have checked the user ID or, or whatever, but I check the session first name. And if that is equal to null, then they're not allowed to access this page. And they get redirected to the login page. All right. The other thing I did is I have the object inserted method. All right. I added that to the details view so that after the insert function happens, I will do this. Remember, there are pairs of events. There's pairs of methods that are tied to events uh, that the user can do. And one is written in the present test, one is written in the past tense. So, for example, details view one item inserted is, is worded in the past tense. So that means that the insert has already happened. Or, probably a better way to put it is the insert has already been attempted. And it may have succeeded or it may have failed. Um, why may it, it why may have it failed? Why may why might have it failed? All right, it might have failed because the database was broke. The database was exclusively open. Um, someone renamed a table. Whatever, something wrong with the database it was exclusively opened <coughs> would be a, a good example of that. For other databases, it might be that the database engine was down. All right. 
or it could be that we violated some of the constraints in the database. Specifically in this one, and it's a tricky one to track for, it's a tricky one to write validation for, is we have no duplicates allowed for the topping name, which would make sense, right? Do you want pepperoni on that pizza or do you want pepperoni on that pizza, right? It doesn't make sense to have two toppings with the exact same name. So even if they're similar, give them a different name to distinguish between the two of them. Yeah. So we're trapping for that error. How do we know that there's an error? Well, remember, this function gets called with event arguments. And that either says in the present tense version of this, so like later on, maybe today or maybe Thursday, we'll look at the item inserting event. That item inserting event arguments will contain what is about to happen. In the case of the item inserted event, that contains what has happened. All right? So one of the properties in that variable E, which is the event arguments, is an exception. If it's null, it means there was no exception. And therefore, we can continue on our merry way and redirect them back to the default page. If, however, there was a problem, we can display a user-friendly error message. And again, what would make a good error message? Well, we would describe what the likely cause of it was and what the user can do to correct it. All right. In this case, I would say there's two likely causes. Number one, we violated the database constraints, which probably we maybe we put in a, du a duplicate um, name, um, or maybe we forgot the name, or whatever. <clears throat> or we put in a wrong value. For calories, we put the word none, N-O-N-E. All right, or a lot, all right, which is not correct, all right, because that's a text box. Remember, what can you put in a text box? You can put anything in a text box, and there's no validation. So this will catch for those kinds of errors. Now, the thing you might ask yourself is, well, I'll, I'll ask you that question in a minute here. So it will catch any sort of error, all right, by trying the statement, and if it doesn't work, it will catch it. And we typically have an idea of what could go wrong. It's either going to be something wrong with the database catastrophically, like the database file was deleted or the database is down for a minute or whatever, or we violated some of the constraints. Like in this case, maybe we put in a duplicate topping. Now, the other kinds of errors that we could get, we could let the exception get them. But it might be better to look for those errors on the client side. Why is it better to try to detect errors on the client side instead of on the server side? The code that we were looking at a minute ago is server side code, right? It's after the server actually tries to update the database. And if there's a failure, it's going to display the message. Why would it be better to catch the errors on the client side? Who does catching the errors on the client side benefit? It benefits the client. How does it benefit the client? Faster? It's faster. Faster. Right? Because you don't have to, the, the, the error is detected as soon as the submit is pressed. It can, be, it can be detected without sending that information through the internet to the server and then waiting for the server to respond with, hey, there's a problem. Now, again, we're used to fast Internet connections. But really, that's a long period of time compared to how quickly client-side code can run. Client-side code can run on a machine virtually instantaneously to tell me, hey, you forgot the topping name, or you forgot the description, or the calories is wrong. It's a non-numeric field. All right? So those kinds of errors can be caught much quicker on the client side, so the client gets a win. 
The client doesn't have to sit there and wait. And if you can imagine being on a slower connection, a busy day on the internet, whatever, um, that could be a little bit of time. So it's more convenient for the client. Is the client the only person or the only entity that benefits from the validation being on the client side? Uh, server. The server also benefits. How does the server benefit? It doesn't have to do any work. doesn't have to do any work. Right? It doesn't have to look at this request and, and try to do a database insert and say, wow, we can insert this. There's no topping name. Or there is, you know, calories is, is letters instead of numbers or whatever. So really, doing the validation client side is a win-win. It's a win for the client. It's a win for the server. If the client gets a faster response, server... Uh, doesn't have to worry about that transaction until it at least looks right. Now, to be sure, there's some validation that's going to happen on the server. All right. For example, we're not going to write any code on the client to validate for duplicate um, topping names. There's really, it would be pretty difficult to do that. All right. So we're going to let that, we're not going to do any validation on the client for that. So the server side is going to do a little bit of validation. And we're going to try to update with duplicate um, uh, topping names. And if it fails, we're just going to be there to clean it up. So that is a valid strategy some of the time, to let this SQL statement fail and then just be there to, to print a user-friendly error message. All right. But if we can handle it on the client side, we might as well. Now, watch. I'm going to try something that's going to fail. All right? I'm saying that so you don't think that, you know, I've lost my mind and lost my programming abilities. All right? So I'm going to try to put a validator on here. Whoops. So I'm going to put a required field validator on the page. And there it is. And I could use CSS to position it. All right? And so on. Now let's look at the properties for this. Let's look for the properties for this uh, um, validator control. name I can put missing um, name. Remember I also put the control to validate. Control to validate. There's nothing there. And this isn't a Visual Studio error. All right? This isn't Visual Studio acting funky. It doesn't seem to recognize the topping name the description, or the calories text boxes. All right? It might not be obvious why, but essentially it can't recognize them because they're part of a details view. All right? Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, with a details view, remember, we can be in one of several different modes. We could be in insert mode where there's a text box there. We could be in read-only mode where there's no text box there, where there's just a label. So therefore, that text box isn't always there. It's not like the text boxes we did the first week of class where we would just plop the text box on the page. There it was. It's always there. This text box lives inside of a detail view. And because of that, it's only displayed some of the time. It's only displayed when you're in insert view or edit view, and it's not there if you're in read-only view. So that text box isn't there like the text boxes were in the early examples. Wow, so what do we do? We have to create what's called a template column. A template column. I don't know why they 
named it that? That's kind of kind of a weird name. All right. Um, when you hear the word template column, what you should think in your mind is, if I say make something into a template column, what that means is it's a column that we want to treat differently than the default. All right. So the default for fields in a details view is, is a text box. All right? Text box if you're inserting or editing, a label if you're in read-only mode. Well, as we know, text boxes might need a validation control. So a text box plus a validation control. That's not part of the standard issue for this component. This component only gives us a text box, doesn't give us a validation control. What if I wanted to use a drop down? Now there's nothing here that needs a drop down. But in another example, there might actually be a drop down that we would want to use. All right? In which case, we would want to be able to select from a drop down instead of having to type it in. Um, I can't think of an example in this problem right now of where we would want to use a drop down, but we'll figure one out at some point. All right? But that's not default behavior, because default behavior is to have a text box. Text boxes for everything, labels and text boxes. Again, is that what we want? Probably not very often. Therefore, we have to customize it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to edit the fields of this details view, and I'm going to make the first column a template column. All right? So I'm going to go here. I'm going to say edit columns. I'm going to find that column, topping name, and I'm going to click this link that says convert field into a template column. All right? And I click OK. Notice it's subtly changed. It says data bound there. All right. But more importantly, I now have this feature av available, edit templates. And there are, there's a bunch of templates. All right. What we can do if, there, if the data is empty. What we want the header to look like. What we want the footer to look like. What, and, and the three that we're most interested in, the item template, which is how this field is going to look in read-only mode, the edit item template, which is how this field is going to be in edit mode, and finally, the one that we're interested in right this minute, the item uh, insert item template. So I select the insert item template, and I get what this will look like in insert mode. Now if I wanted to drop down there instead of a text box, I'd delete this, the text box and I'd drag a drop down here. Alright? So if I wanted a drop box there, I'd just go and, or drop down there rather, I would go and drag that over there and delete the um, text box. Alright? But I, I do want it to be a text box. I just want there to be a validation control associated with it. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go and put up here a required field validator. And I'm not going to put it anywhere on the page. I'm going to put it right next to the template field. All right? And then I can validate it. What control do I want to validate? There's that text box, text box one. So if I'm within a template field, the validator can only see the things within that template field. So that's nice. So if we want to validate that text box, we can pick that to validate that text box. And we can put in, like for the message, missing topping name. So now when I run this, Log on. Go to add 
topping. Oops. Control property of, of required field validator one cannot be blank. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought I had deleted it. Thank you. That's the one that it's complaining about. There you go. It really makes me feel good when I make a mistake in class and students can pick up what I did wrong. All right. It, it, it really is good. It's a good, good, uh, I say good evidence of troubleshooting skills. Um, there's actually a school of thought, by the way, that is called extreme programming. All right, don't you love how everything at a certain like at a certain point in the '90s everything became extreme? You know, there's extreme Taco Bell and extreme Mountain Dew and and all that. Well, extreme programming um, said that one person at a time shouldn't program. There should be two people programming. All right, at at, at a time sharing one computer. And one person types and the other one watches. All right? Sometimes I think maybe that was pattern after road repair groups, right? Where there's like the one guy shoveling asphalt and like a whole crew sitting around smoking and drinking coffee and watching the other guy work. So maybe they're ahead of the game, right? Uh, but the idea is, is the old two heads are better than one. Two sets of eyes are better than one. Um, it's a good idea, for example, when you are running into a problem in your code, to show it to someone. Because I'll tell you what happens. Very often, one of two things happens. Thing one, all right, to use the Dr. Seuss uh, characters, uh, thing one is that when you're explaining it to the other person, you notice something that you overlooked yourself. Like, well, what I'm doing is I'm putting this if statement, oh, wait a minute, that if statement is wrong, all right? A lot of times that happens. And I've noticed it so many times that when students call me over and I ask them what's the problem, and they just go and they explain it to me that they themselves spot the error because it takes, it takes, a, takes some thought to explain what your code's doing to someone else. And when you do that, sometimes you miss things that, that you overlooked. The other thing is, is one of those things where you've been staring at it so long that you just, you know, are missing something maybe that's fairly straightforward, but you've just been working on this and you're getting frustrated and whatever. And the other person that brings a fresh set of, the fresh set of eyes to the problem can look at it and say, oh yeah, that's what's wrong. All right. So it's always good to have me or someone else in the class if you're running into a problem, take a look at it and explain it to them. So I urge you to try that. that that's, that's great. People do that all the time in programming. All right. So anyhow, I'm going to go in here and we're going to click Add Toppings. I'm going to go and click Insert, and boom, I get Missing Topping Name. So this is a very specific error, right? I don't have to give one of them vague database, well, something bad happened but I'm not going to tell you exactly what, because I'm not sure exactly what. All right? I can give a specific error. All right? And we could put any kind of validation in here, too. Um, remember, we can put garbage. It's a text box, right? Text boxes hold text, all right? Um, but obviously, number of calories has to be a number. All right, so if I click insert, it's going to blow up. And I could give that as a probable error, but why do that when I could just go in and easily put a validator? Remember, if it's possible to do the validation client side, do it client side. All right, so I am going to. went and got out of template mode to get back to here. What I'd like someone to do, I'm just going to be the mouse clicker here. All right. How would we add validation to calories to make sure that 
it was numbers. If I wasn't clear, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to sit here and click on the things that people tell me. Toolbox? A toolbox. Okay. Well, again, our toolbox disappeared. Let's go out and back in. All right, toolbox what? Validation. Okay. one of two. We could do a compare validator or a range validator. Compare. All right. So I'm going to drag this here. Now what? Remember, 
if you want to do something beyond the default behavior for a column, you have to convert it to a template column first. All right? And when you convert something to a template column, it just does that column. So I convert a topping name, but none of the others are template columns. They're still getting the default behavior. All right? This one, however, we don't want the default behavior on. All right, we want to do a validation. Specifically, we want to do a validation that says um, that um, it has to be a number. All right, so convert to template field. All right. Now, when I click edit template, notice what I have. I have two fields to choose from. I have the topping name, which was the first one that I did. And I have calories, which is the second one I did. All right? Second one I did there. So I'm going to pick that. And specifically, I want to change the insert item template. Again, notice that there's four of these templates. The item template, which is read only. Alternating item template, which is... <coughs> typically used with grid views where you can like offset it on alternating items so it's easier to read. Edit item is if you're in edit mode. Insert template is in uh, insert mode and that's the one that we want. So I can go in here or I can just pick it from there and only get the one. I don't like to see all four of the templates. That confuses me. So I usually go into the one that I want to change. Insert item and there we go. Now, I can go and drag the compare validator. I'm not going to place it here. I'm going to place it here. All right. And my compare validator, I can change the error message to say must be a number. I can select my operator as data type check. I can set my type to integer. And I can set my control to validate to text box 2. Notice that text box 2, again, is the only choice. All right? Because when you're putting a validator within a template column, you're limited to just validating the things for that template column. So that kind of makes your life easy, right? You don't have to like figure out which text box or whatever to edit. So I'm going to put that control validator on text box two. And now when we go and run this, I log on. Can add? Excuse me. If I go and try to insert this with a missing topping and a missing calories, I get both those error messages. All right. So I can put in tomatoes and 50, and then insert it. And there you go. Yes? Um, just because I'm curious, uh, is there a way to change it so that visually, like it doesn't look so chunky? Yes. Because it leaves that space open for the error message? Yes. And remember, I'm only your humble mouse clicker today, so I'm not going to tell you how to do that. Okay. Your <laughs> yeah, is a secret. No, you're going to tell me how to do that. How do we make it so, I mean, face it, yeah, that doesn't really look good. How can we make this look better? Is there, like, can you put, like, a hidden value on that, on the error validator, so that that space isn't used up unless... Maybe.
AB. We actually saw an attribute that sort of does that, that wasn't a hidden attribute. Do we remember what attribute we can use to tell the error message not to take up space if there's nothing there? Static or dynamic? Static or dynamic, exactly. So, if I look at this, one of the properties of this is display. Static or dynamic. I can make it dynamic. What that means, it won't take up any space if it's not there. It will take up space if it's there. So I can do that to this template, and then I can do that to this validation template. So we don't have that space now. Now, let's go and see where the air displays. That was weird. All right. It displays it underneath it. What if we want to display it alongside? Well, if we don't want to display it directly underneath, we want to display it along the side of it. What does it look like now? Repeat that? Uh, in Visual Studio, what does it look like now? Yeah. Right, I'm not sure I know what you mean, but we can take a look at it in Visual Studio. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it's under it now. Would you change it in CSS? Uh, you know, I, this 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 class seems to be more like a game show. I need to have like <laughs> buzzers that like if if someone gives a wrong answer to give the uh, you know not that you were giving a wrong answer you you were on the right track. Yeah. Uh, but when someone gives a good answer, I need like the ding, 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 like, you know, and confetti to drop from the ceiling and, and the whole bit. All right. You're absolutely right. How did you know it was CSS? Because you're changing the way it looks. Because you're changing the way it looks, right? Changing content is an HTML or uh, whatever. Uh, could be a server-side scripting thing. Changing the way it looks is a CSS thing. Now. We could deal with this a couple different ways. One way we could deal with this is to look at the properties of the detail view. Because I'm sure there's all kinds of properties in this detail view that we could set. Like for number one, there's a width. All right. I'm going to get rid of the width. All right. And... Well, look what it did. Wow. All right. In fact, it will put it alongside of it. All right. If the window is big enough. Because, and this comes back to, I think I told you this story, but I'm getting to the point where I repeat my stories. All right. This gets back to the exact question I had, uh, the issue I had with the someone who wanted me to write a, uh, a textbook chapter on ASP.NET. Their claim was you don't need to know HTML to write ASP.NET code. And that's correct. You don't need to know HTML and CSS to write crappy ASP.NET code. But our goal isn't to write crappy ASP.NET code, right? Our goal is to write good ASP.NET code. And good ASP.NET code is, is just it's creating web pages. So we're going to follow the same standards for web pages that we do for any sort of web page. And that is, for appearance, we're going to do it with CSS. So all I did is remove that property of the width from here. All right? 
and it took care of it itself. If we needed to do more, we could, my suggestion would be to run this. Mm, okay. Let's run it and see what happens. All right, that may be what we want, to have it alongside of it. All right, if that's not how we want, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at the HTML that was generated. And I'm going to scroll through. And notice, first of all, they already throw some of their own crappy style in this. Ugh, I hate that. Um, but you could go through and get rid of that if you wanted to. But notice that this is a table. So I could put a style rule for a table. Or I could give it a class and put a style rule for things that have that class. All right. Let's do that. And I hope the properties that are set in Visual Studio don't mess me up. Because I hate that. Get rid of that. If I want the height, I'm going to set it myself. So I'm going to go and give this guy a class. CSS class, I'm going to say entry table. All right. Then I'm going to go create my CSS file. Style sheet. Do I already have a style sheet? That's so. Let's go check. I do. Oh, they did create it for me. Well, guess what? It's out of there. All right. And I'm going to say I gave it a class of what? Entry table. So I'm going to say entry table. <coughs> with 60% min with 400 pixels um, margin 0 pixel auto so I should center it, make it approximately 60% of the screen no smaller than 400 pixels. So I'll go and run this. And that's what we're going to get, I hope. And we didn't. All right. Uh, let's see if I can figure out why we didn't. I will bet this page doesn't have that style sheet associated with it. And it doesn't. I 
typically, every time I like to make a change, I like to stop the debugger, the debugger and restart it. Because I've seen things where the code doesn't get compiled and doesn't refresh and all that. So that would be my suggestion. To every time you make a change in the code, don't just click refresh. Go exit the debugger and restart the debugger. And there we go. Yay. Cool. <coughs> All right, so the message here, the, 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 how do I want to say, the specific answer I gave is all well and good, but the bigger message, um, the preferred way of doing things would be to do it via CSS, because then if I had another page that had data entry table, I could give it the same class, all right, and I would ensure, ensure a consistent look uh, in all of them. So this is still web development. And CSS is your best bet for <coughs> doing things, uh, for, for changing the appearance of, of stuff on your web page. That being said, there is code that you can use in ASP.NET through Visual Studio to set some visual properties. Sometimes that can get in the way of your CSS code and you might have to remove it. There are a handful of things that um, well, I don't even know if there are. There used to be, but with CSS3, um, there, there's been some improvements. For example, we can alternate rows and make alternating rows different colors in a, in a table. So, I would prefer, my, my preference would be to do the styling versus, uh, uh, via CSS. All right, for all the reasons that we do it on plain old web pages with CSS. Questions? Now, I want to mention something now, and we'll probably come back to it at some point, but I want to mention it in case you need to do this on your project. All right? And that is, the thing that we haven't looked at putting any code in yet is in the item inserting event. We put code in the item inserted event, but not the item inserting event. If you remember back <coughs> in this add pizza that we custom coded, pizza. I set some parameters not based on the text boxes, but based on like a session variable. If there's a field that is updated in the database that is not going to be manually entered in, all right, then um, you are going to, um, I'm losing my train of thought here, um, a field that is not manually entered in but needs to be inserted in the database then you can put code in the item inserting event to insert that item. And we'll talk about how you do that um, either later on or if I don't cover it in class and you need to do it or you think you need to do it, talk to me individually and I'll review it with you. All right. So like, for example, um, we might want to store the user ID of the person that um, created the pizza or the person that entered the review, all right? Um, that's not going to be entered in. So I'm not going to write a review and give credit to someone else, right? It, ha it should come from my user ID automatically. I shouldn't have to key anything in, all right? Now, I talked about solving that problem by custom writing all of the code to do the insert. You can also use the out-of-the-box method, but then you'd have to put some code in the item inserting event to populate the field with that parameter. All right, what I want to do for the rest of class today, we have about 15 minutes, is talk about the two other statements um, that um, are used to maintain data in the database. And these are the update, and the 
delete statements. Okay? Now, the form of the update statement looks like this. Update. The name of the table. Updates, inserts, and deletes, remember, directly only work with one table. All right? I'll have more words about the directly part of that sentence when we talk about deletes. Update, the name of the table. The word set. Column equals value. Column equals value. Column equals value. For as many columns as you have. And then we're probably going to have a where clause on it. And for the code that we are writing, it will probably include the primary key. Now, it doesn't have to, but it probably will for the kinds of updates that we are doing. All right? Behind the scenes, I could write a SQL statement that updates every Ohio customer to set their discount rate to 25%. You know, if, if that was our company's policy. But typically, that's not going to be done through a UI. Through a UI, we're going to pick an individual row in the database that we want to update. All right? I want to update the name of this specialty pizza. I want to update the calories for this topping. I want to update the title for this movie. I want to update the birthday for this actor. So we're picking a row, and we're updating certain things about it. So typically, in our cases, it's going to be where primary key equals question mark. Now, this is one of the reasons I said that I'm always going to pick the primary key no matter what, because if I'm going to do updates, I'm going to need that primary key. Now, again, what I have up there on the board is typically how we are going to use it. You certainly don't have to have a where clause for example. And your where clause could be something other than a primary key in some other context. But most of the basic, um, I'm going in and I'm inserting, I'm changing, I'm deleting, is gonna, uh, that we're going to do on our websites is going to be like this. Because we're going to deal with one row at a time, typically. What would happen if we omitted the where clause? What do you think is going to happen? It'll do it for all of them in that table. It'll do it for all of them in that table. Remember, the where clause limits um, limits the rows in the database that are going to be affected. So if I forgot the where clause and I issued an update statement, it would update or try to update every row in that table. So the where clause is important. All right. Normally, as I said, in the kinds of code we're writing, again, not every single update that you can dream up, but the code that we're writing, we're going to want to limit it to one row. Therefore, we need a, uh, a where clause. And therefore, the where clause should be looking at the primary key, because the primary key guarantees that we're looking at one row. If I have a statement like this, update table, column equals value, column equals value, column equals value, where primary key equals question mark, what happens if I give a primary key that doesn't exist? Nothing. All right. I was going to say, that, you know, too bad hand gestures aren't accepted on <laughs> tests, because that's absolutely right. Nothing happens, right? A lot of people think you'll get an error. It won't get an error, all right? If I said update table set column equals this, column equals that, column equals that, where primary key equals 456, and there was no 456 in the database, you don't get an error, just nothing gets updated. The SQL statement thinks it did its job. It updated every row where the primary key was this. And, hey, there weren't any rows. 
It would be like, <laughs> it'd be like, I don't know, uh, you tell someone to wash all the windows in a closet. All right? Someone looks and okay, I washed all the windows in there. There ain't any windows, and I washed all of them, right? Same idea here. All right, that's probably a really dumb analogy. I don't know why I thought of that, but anyhow. That's true for an update and a delete when we talk about a delete. What can go wrong with an update? Many of the same things can go wrong with an update that can go wrong with an insert. In other words, if we violate the constraints, if I try to change a value where there's a foreign key, all right, um, then if I change it to a non-existent value, then I'm going to get an error, all right? Or if I give the wrong type of data, I'm going to get an error, all right? If I know out a field that's required, if I change a value so that there's a duplicate where there shouldn't be a duplicate, I'm going to get an error. Error. Typically, we do not allow changes to the primary key. That's why um, some people ask, should I say cascade updates in the database? It doesn't really matter what you say for updates because you're not going to be changing that anyhow. You're not going to change the primary key. You can change the primary key, but you usually don't. All right? There's really no need to um, in a case like this, especially when you use auto number fields. So that's what an update statement looks like. All right. What does a delete statement look like? Oh, there is an irony here. The delete statement is the most dangerous statement, and it's also the easiest statement. All right. Delete from table <coughs> where probably primary key equals some value. Again, the kind of coding we're doing, we're going to be dealing with one row of the database at a time. Therefore, we're going to delete a single row. All right? Therefore, we need a where clause. And that where clause ought to use the primary key. If I said delete from table and did not have a where clause, yeah, everything is gone. And you know what? Depending on how cascade deletes are, everything could be gone in a bunch of tables. All right? Because what does a cascade delete do? Cascade delete is when you have a one-to-many relationship and you've established a foreign key. We'll call this the parent and the child. The parent can have many children, the children only have one parent table. If this is set to cascade delete, one thing to remember, the cascade delete part only goes from the parent to the child. It doesn't go the other way around. It doesn't go from the child to the parent. So, for example, let's say this table is a student table. And it has a student ID name, email, and so on down the line. And the child table is courses, student courses, or course student, where the primary key to this is the course ID, the student ID, the grade that the student got, and so on down the line. And there's a foreign key between here and here. Now, as you can see, one student could have many courses, right? A given course, though, a given course student row is only associated with one student. So, if I delete a course student, the cascading delete is not relevant. It's not in play. 
because it only goes from deleting the parent to the child. All right? So if a, a student has six courses that they're taking and they get rid of one, they drop it, and it gets deleted, wow. then it doesn't go and delete the student row. That doesn't make any sense, right? Just because they drop a class doesn't mean that you, you delete the, the student altogether. Now, if for some reason the student was deleted, you could either set cascade delete to restrict or cascade. I think in access it says cascade yes or no. So the opposite of cascade is restrict. And let's make sure we understand what these are. If we say cascade, if we delete the parent, it will delete all the children rows. All right? If we say restrict, if we try to delete the student, it won't allow us if there are courses on file for that student. Now, you can't say one way or another what, uh, what you do most of the time, right? There's not an easy answer to say that cascade, yes or no. You have to consider the problem. Let's think of a couple problems. with deletes. Let's look at this one. I have a faculty member, a faculty table that has a faculty ID, <coughs> information about the faculty. There's a one-to-many relationship between faculty and student primary key student ID, and each student gets assigned a faculty advisor, and there's a foreign key relationship between those. There should always be a foreign key relationship if you can, right, because you want to implement all the constraints in the database level if possible. So, would we want to cascade delete in that scenario? No. What would it mean if I cascaded delete? Explain that in, in just, not database terms, but explain that in just real world words. If you delete the tag, <coughs> right. you will delete all the students associated with that tag. Right. So if <coughs> Professor Zellers hits the lottery and retires, they delete him out of the faculty table, all the students that Zellers advised would have to drop out of school. Correct. All right. I don't think we would want that to happen, right? No. What would we want to have happen? You can't delete Zellers until there's no more students remaining that are advised by him. So you would want restrict in this scenario. <coughs> so that if you tried to delete, to delete Zellers and there were students associated with them, you wouldn't be able to delete them until those students got assigned to someone else. And you could actually write a nice little program if you wanted to, where you could pick the advisor and click transfer, and you could actually do an update statement that updated everyone at Zellers. Maybe everyone that, that Zellers advised gets assigned to Harms now, for example. So you could write a program where you could pick Harms and say transfer Zellers to Harms, and that might be a case where you'd use an update that wouldn't use the, the primary key. All right? But the bottom line is, no matter how you deal with it, if you write a little program to deal with it, or if you deal with it on a one-by-one -one basis, you certainly can't have a student out there. You certainly can't delete a student. Um, um, you wouldn't want to delete all the students that Zellers advised. And therefore, you wouldn't be able to delete Zellers as long as there were students advised by them. All right? What would be another case, though, of maybe if we have this, you have an order that's associated with order items, 
and each of these is associated to an item table. <coughs> if I want to cancel an order, so I say that order one, two, three, I want to cancel it. I want to cancel the whole order. So when I delete it, should I cascade to the order items? Sure. All right. If I get a better deal somewhere else, I say I want to cancel this order. I shouldn't have to go and individually delete the items first and then go and delete the order. So it should cascade. So I should be able to say, I want to delete this order and delete all the order items associated with it. Now, will it delete all the items associated with it? No, because remember, cascades only go from parent to child. And in this case, items are not a child of order items. We could have a chain of cascades Maybe for each item, there's an order item discount table. In which case, I'd cascade delete from here to here, cascade delete from here to here. So if I took out an order, it would get rid of all the items and all the discounts associated with those items. Remember, though, a delete either completely succeeds or completely fails. So if you go to delete something and... There's a restrict constraint on one of the foreign keys. It doesn't matter how many cascade delete constraints there are. If there's one restrict constraint that prohibits you from deleting it, nothing gets deleted. That's the way all SQL statements work. Um, I think the, the fancy name for that is that SQL statements are atomic. All right? That is, you don't, you don't split up. I, I, this is like old-fashioned stuff because you can split an atom, right, in physics class. But <coughs> the idea of atomic is that is indivisible, all right? So the whole statement succeeds or the whole statement fails, all right? And therefore, if you go to delete something, if there's a constraint that keeps something from be being deleted, then none of the other cascades work, all right? Um, okay. Next time, we will pick up talking about using our framework classes to do uh, updates and inserts. Uh, I'm sorry, updates and deletes. I, at some point, want to get a drop-down in there, so maybe I'll make up a new example or new tables or something. And I want to do an example of where we use the components, but we... Uh, manually insert a value in the database. All right, we'll see you in lab. I'm going to go over there and unlock, then I'll come back over here to grab the stuff, and then I'll be back there.